Um, ladies and gentlemen, it really is an extraordinary honor and privilege to introduce not only one of the great trial lawyers uh, in the United States today, but one of the great trial lawyers ever to practice in the United States today. Uh, Joe Jamal is truly a lawyer's lawyer. Um, when a what? Nothing. Okay. Uh, when a significant issue arises, uh, when there's a huge amount at stake, when people say, I've got to go and I've got to find the best lawyer in the country to handle a trial matter, um, this is the name that comes up again and again and again. And Joe Jamal is a man who hates to lose. He's a man who loves to win. And he's a man who does win, except for the fact that I just beat him, didn't I? He did. There you go. So let me tell you, all right? There you go. So let me tell you. Joe and I were just having a chat, and I was explaining, you know, I was kind of concerned that we wouldn't have much of a turnout. I'm thrilled that everybody's here. I was afraid that it would just be the two of us. All right, and Joe looks at me and says, you know, if it was the two of us, we'd go out somewhere and we'd just have a drink. And I go, that's a great idea. All right, and I said, you know, I'd go out and I'd probably, you know, buy a single malt scotch, but I bet you you drink whiskey. And Joe tells me, no, no, I love single malt scotches. And I go, well, that's really interesting because I love single malt scotches too. All right, and we start talking about single malt scotches. And then Joe starts, and he looks at me and says, well, you know, I bet you I've got the largest single malt scotch collection that you've ever heard of. And what'd you say? What'd you tell me, Joe? I'm not going to answer that. Okay. <laughs> Hang on, I got a subpoena right here. Uh, no, you but want but me to tell you what to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> you're not, you're not, in in this jurisdiction, I got it. So 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 Joe looks at me, all right, and and straight in the eye, he says, "I've got a dozen different single malt scotches," and I go, "Big deal." All right, I got 36 single. You thought you were actually going to win this competition, all right, with, with, with a simple dozen. And Joe looks at me and says, you know, you beat me. So I'm looking forward to the occasion when I'll have you over to the house. We'll open up the liquor locker. I'll show you all 36, the highlands, the lowlands, the space sides. You're going to give me the cheap ones, right? I'll let you pick. <laughs> I'll let you pick. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll rip off the price tags before you come over. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one of the great trial lawyers of all time, Joe Janelle. Well, I don't know how many of you heard me earlier today, and uh, I hope that I don't repeat myself, but probably will in some instances. I'm going to talk about something a little different tonight. I talked today to students who wanted to hear about cases and some of the cases that I've tried, and I told them about some of them. A lot of them are funny. A lot of them are tragic. But tonight it's different. I want to talk to you about the general philosophy as I see our law, where we've been, where we're going, what our responsibilities are, the ethical and moral requirements are necessary for us to maintain and improve on lawyers and businessmen alike. And we're not the enemies of business. Without us, they're dead. Without anybody, the rule of law is dead. It's lawyers that are the rule of law. How much kindness do you think the individual citizen would have in an area where he had to fight a corporation, a major corporation, and there was no lawyer and there's no rule of law. You squash him like a bug. Thank our country for still having a semblance of the rule of law, although there are many who tried to destroy it by putting caps on things. Like, how do you cap paint? I don't know how. I'll get into that in a minute. And, and taking away the jury trial from people or diluting the jury trial, we're seeing more and more of it every day. The Supreme Court has ruled a week ago in a case that made no sense to me. However, 
that says goodbye to class action lawsuits. They've, they've substituted reasonableness and put in perfect, and there's nothing perfect, so it isn't going to work. I believe today that the American people have become the most timorous people since we were a nation. I believe that the average American now does not believe he is accountable for the duty to preserve the liberties that all of us enjoy. What the American people have today, instead of leaders, are press agents, politicians without any convictions, lobbyists, cheerleader types, and a manipulative media. Well, I don't for a minute think that only lawyers are the honorable people in our nation, but there are some of us who are worthy of being called lawyers. Those who do the good, the pro bono work, and the other things that they do, who represent their clients and whose clients' interests are primary, their interests are secondary. Those are the real lawyers. And I know firsthand, because of some of the positions I've had, that my profession has many undesirable, greedy, unconcerned, dishonest attorneys in our ranks, and I refuse to prefer them as lawyers. And for that, I am ashamed. They're not the ones who view this, the lawyers I'm talking about, are not the ones who view this profession as a business. Those are the money changers, the ones I've talked to you earlier. Greed is their motto. There are those lawyers that I want to talk to you about who believe that equality is the primary concern of people on this planet. And they're the ones who have made a difference in your lives and in my life. I was taught that a lawyer is a custodian of the community's legal and ethical sense. So we should act like it. Ethics and morality of lawyers and business people. We've got a job convincing businessmen that lawyers are not their enemy. We're not the enemy of business. We protect their rights and their freedoms. Their resentment comes from having to pay lawyers fees, not from the lawyers themselves, but they don't resist being paid fees themselves. But we've got a job to do, and that is education letting businessmen know that we are their biggest ally in the fight to preserve their freedoms and their right to do business. Now, a grave concern has been expressed by others as well as me that the legal profession today is viewed with distrust, dislike, and suspicion by too many people in too many places. There's a widespread public impression that the practice of law has become a business, primarily a money-grubbing, profit-maximizing, bustling business, hustling business, rather than an admired and esteemed profession. This has brought into question the intention, integrity, and value of the profession generally. Lawyer bashing has become a peculiar indoor and outdoor sport where telling a lawyer joke, you can count on getting loud guffaws and laughter from everyone. How'd all this happen? I've been doing this for 50 years, and I've seen the greatest changes in the law that I think will ever occur. And we'll get into some of them. Most of them have been good. How'd all this happen? How did we get to the point where to acknowledge that you are a lawyer in the legal profession is to invite scoffing and derision. The legal profession years ago was an esteemed and honored profession. Becoming a member meant joining a helping hand, a helping profession, one which dealt with the problems of people and did so sensitively and effectively. We regarded ourselves as charged with the public trust, committing to strengthening our system of law, equality, and justice. But over the years, 
Something, however, seriously disturbing has been happening to our legal profession. Increasingly, the law has become a business rather than a profession. Too many of our large law firms and law firms, the computer has become the managing partner. We're ruled by hourly rates or the bottom line, the dollar. In acceding to this, we have then go hand in hand with those who would betray our profession. We're ruled by timesheets, electronic devices. We've seen an increase in technology and expertise with a corresponding decrease in the human side of the law practice. And that's why I was so impressed today that this great law school, the clinics that I was allowed to talk to and to see, are trying to rectify that in its own way, and you should be very proud of that. Today, many lawyers and businessmen alike have come to accept the proposition that the client is best able to judge what he needs, more so than the lawyer, and the lawyer must be ready to do whatever the client wishes. Let me tell you this. When a lawyer accedes to this, the lawyer has sold away the only thing of value that he has, his independence. For if the lawyer stands ready to do whatever the client wants, what the hell does the client need with him? He deprives the client of the one thing the client is most entitled to have, the best advice the lawyer can give him as to whether what the client wants done should really be done or not. What makes us professional is our insistence that in legal matters, we set the parameters of what we will do and what will be done and what we won't do. And the client cannot set those parameters for us. We tell the client what's for the client's best interest, not in our best interest, but the client, if the client does not succeed to that, and I've had some who didn't, we wave goodbye, I withdraw. Because you can't be at conflict with the client. If he's no longer, if the client's not gonna listen to you, why? What are you going to do? Just collect money for nothing? Lead him down the drain? I don't believe it. And to those critics who, who decry the fact that so many people are seeking redress for wrongs through the courts, I suggest they've got it all wrong. Claimants and people who bring their grievances to our courts are saying by their actions, we are a people who believe in our court system. We are a people who believe in our system of justice. We believe our court system and our jurisprudence has integrity and honesty and accessibility. Strong word. We need to keep the accessibility in mind. The reason it has fallen to the real trial lawyers to guard the people's rights is because who else is going to do it? There's no one else qualified to do it. We need to stop as much as we can the greedy from grinding under the consumers and the needy. We need to help poor get legal help when it's needed. Our bar associations across our nation have totally failed us in that regard. What are the people going to say? Need lawyers that can't afford the $500 an hour or the $1,000 an hour. Look, when we seek help in the legislature, we're powerless. We don't have any money. We don't have any lobby. No political action committees. And the slumbering bureaucracies of government won't respond to our pleas. I say to these critics that think that there's an explosion of litigation, that they've got it all wrong. They ought to think about the alternative. Get rid of the courts and go back to trial by combat or vengeance in the streets. We're seeing that all over the world where there's no rule of law. I don't know what they're thinking when they do this. Because without us and our protecting them, those that are trying to do the most to damage the profession and people who rely on them, the elderly, the poor, the helpless, the hopeless, they're the ones that are selling their goods to them. And I, I don't get it. I just don't get it. They want to make enemies out of the lawyer. They control much of the media through the advertisements that they do. 
They're honest businessmen. I know. I've represented many of them. Some of them not so honest. But I'm there. I did it my way. I didn't let them tell me how to try the case. From the beginning of humanity, we've been told that justice is the greatest concern of people on earth. Other professions erect buildings that fall down, bridges that wash out, planes and ships that rust into obsolescence. Even the steel of our sacred Statue of Liberty wore out in a hundred years. But during that time, lawyers who don't build with steel or stone or rock, but with much sturdier stuff, quality, accessibility, truth, helpfulness, and justice. And I'm going to ask you to think about it for a minute. Homer never built of rock or steel, nor did Socrates, nor did Jesus. Yet, their ideas live on. They build with more enduring stuff, inspiration, beauty, and truth. In one century, the Statue of Liberty wore out over two centuries ago, a lawyer named Thomas Jefferson put on paper the Declaration of Independence. He had help. It stands today strong. Over 200 years later, it's a landmark. Human progress of ideas, born of arguments nurtured by eloquent lawyers like Patrick Henry, Samuel Adams, and finally made a monument on paper etched indelibly in the minds of free men and women wherever they exist. Almost as long ago, a group comprised almost entirely of lawyers built something called the Constitution, forged the steel of arguments among lawyers. Just ideas, this living Constitution. Only ideas. But look where it brought us. Constant building and tending by generations of lawyers including you and those who even follow us, have kept it vital and growing. Today's lawyers must constantly reinforce it. We are supposed to be the custodians of the community's legal and ethical sense. To a significant extent, the loss of self-respect in the profession and the loss of public respect both reflect the failure of our schools to convey to the young what law and lawyers have meant in the history of this country and our bar associations whose total function is to collect dues and take trips that do nothing to give access to justice that I know anything about. Lawyers above all others must understand why we have been granted exclusive access to the judicial process of government and why the public has a right to expect that they will be vigilantly protected, not only in the interest of their clients, but also for the rule of law that protects us all. This applies to businessmen and lawyers alike. And when we talk about law, what are we talking about? We're talking about an original, an organized, reasonable, accepted way for people to live together and settle their disputes without resort to force. Everywhere we look today, everywhere in the world, we see wars, monstrous wars, atrocities caused by large, in large part by the absence of law as a shield for the people. We have a government of laws and not men, thanks to lawyers. What do lawyers do? Let me talk to you about it. We have a free press, thanks to lawyers. We have a police restrained by process, the due process thanks to lawyers. We have juries brave enough to seek out and pursue that eternal and best pursuit of humankind, justice. In just the time that I have been a lawyer, many sweeping improvements in the quality of justice have been accomplished by lawyers without legislation, lawyers and judges. These include desegregation of our schools, and most of the rest of our society. One man, one vote, strict products liability laws, virtual elimination of tort immunities, governmental and charitable as well, rights of the retarded, education, 
the rights of counsel in criminal cases, the rights of illegitimate children, the Miranda rule, the protection we've got against police brutality, and anybody that believes the police cannot be brutal is naive, and they would use any means. But we have that law by lawyers before judges, making it part of our law. We have liability for emotional injury, compensation for the bereaved survivors. The list could go on and on and on. But those are the things that happened just in my lifetime as a lawyer. All these landmarks, lawyers have built, and it's not without a purpose. There is a singular theme that runs through all of it. Overall, the one great theme of law reform in our time has been equality. Just in my lifetime, we've seen progress, mainly through lawyers and courts, in building equality. We still have to build equality because there still is not total equality, even in our own nation. We can do something about it. We can be the ones who help change and make it all equal as best we can. Lawyers brought about equality between the races, equality almost between the sexes, not quite, equality between citizens, equality between rich and poor, equality between prosecutor and defendant. Lawyers did this without Congress and without legislation. On a personal note, I have handled and tried four cases that resulted in national and international recall because the products caused death and serious damage. The government didn't recall them, ever. There were cases I tried that took them off the market. They were all approved by our government. The FDA approved them. Drugs that stoked out young women after having children, things of that nature. This is what lawyers are about, what lawyers do. And they say, well, are you proud you bankrupted these people? Yes. <laughs> I was well paid. But the reward is even greater. And I said this earlier today. The reward of knowing you're helping someone, like the young people in these classes that I was privileged to talk to in the clinics, that reward of knowing I helped somebody, that'll stay with you all your life. And uh, if you handle yourself, you, I don't know how many of you are going to be or in trial practice, but those of you who are in it, if you handle yourself keeping your client's interests first in your mind and your own interests not involved in decision making, you'll get honored, you'll be respected, and you'll get plenty of money, you'll get plenty of clients. It just happens to good lawyers. Now, what goes into making a good lawyer? I wish I could tell you. I could. I guess I'd bottle it, sell it, make some money. But I don't know. I know I do. I just know this. I can only say to you that you don't learn it in law school. Law school teaches us evidence, teaches us procedure, and teaches us generally a different way to approach problems and think about it, rather than as an undergraduate school, the trick was to vomit back whatever the professor told you or read the answer out of the textbook. What your professors here are trying to teach you, and this is one of the greatest law schools in the world, are trying to teach you is this. Look, there is no real answer to these problems. We want to know how you would approach it what your logical thinking is in arriving at your conclusions. You can, there's no, you read the case book, the case the, could go either way. It, it, uh, it's not a question of an answer, it's not a mathematical prob problem. This is a problem that they want you to think through, use your logic, your practical intelligence, and come to the conclusion that you think is the right conclusion for the facts that are for, before you. That's what, good lawyer is about. Now, I can only tell you that I think a lawyer, you need, I'm not, I'm not too denigrating law schools, but a lawyer is really the sum total of every experience he or she has ever had. Learned from her mother, father, grandparents, 
friends, schoolmates, enemies, anybody and everybody. Remembering those experiences and putting them to use. And I would, if I had my way, I would encourage law schools to either force or encourage law, prospective law students to take many courses in liberal arts, history, philosophy, sociology, psychology, because you have to know and understand emotions and people in order to be able to convey that to a jury or a judge. Now they tell you in law school, they told me, I don't know what to tell you, they told you here, that you can't get involved with your clients. You've got to be objective. You cannot let, you cannot be involved. Well to that I say bullshit. Simply because if I don't get involved with that client, how am I going to get the judge and jury involved with the client? It just doesn't work that way. But think what you can do with, with all of the ancient literature, history, philosophy, sociology, things we've learned, and oratory, and being an advocate, and being able to convey these things and identify with them, and telling and being a lawyer in a courtroom is mainly teaching. That's what it is. You're teaching the jury about your facts, teaching the judge, in fact, about your facts, and applying the applicable law. So I look at it as teaching. I can't list the ingredients that make a good lawyer or not. I just don't know them. But a good lawyer needs to feel the plight of his client, know all those things I told you about, to be able to communicate. There's another troubling thing that I see in the media and I see, read about and hear about, and that is the flippant way, is the only way I know how to put it, nonchalant, cheerful way in which many of our citizens are prepared to throw away these cherished freedoms and rights that have been fought for by those lawyers and those people before us. It's so hard to, for me to see us throw away rights that have taken centuries to establish. At Runnymede, they went to all that trouble to get a jury trial. Now a lot of lawyers and judges with the mindset of an accountant want to abolish jury trials. England, the greatest contribution they made to law was instituting the jury trial. They've done away with it now in everything except libel cases and some criminal cases. And they're trying to do away with that in the name of expedience, budget, I don't get it. Our professional ancestors fought bitterly to get the presumption of innocence, the mighty safety net against prosecutorial lynching. I talked to some of the clinic today who are fighting hard to preserve those rights. We don't seem to give a damn about it anymore. If someone uses a constitutional right to say that I'm going to insist on taking the Fifth Amendment on the grounds that it might tend to incriminate me, all of a sudden, he gets branded a criminal for exercising a right that he has a right to exercise. We went wrong somewhere. I don't know how, why. Maybe we need a mental trip back to Runnymede and cut off some king's head every few years to remind us of this. <laughs> Let me uh, tell you a story, and I'm going to quit you and ask, answer questions. There's a... I want to tell you about the most famous case that I think that I have ever, ever heard about or read about. Before I do that, all of you will have read and know about a great justice who lived years ago named Justice Leonard Hand. And Leonard Hand said in an article that I read and have never forgotten, back to equality, and accessibility to justice, back to helping the helpless and the hopeless. He said, lawyers should have but one commandment, thou shalt not ration justice. If we keep that in mind, maybe we'll start helping. We need to do it. Now, let me uh, tell you about a sanctity of the jury trial. I mentioned to you earlier about how important the jury trial is. You take a judge, I don't care who he is, the very best of them, and you do away with a jury trial, 
and if he sees enough of one of the, for instance, bring it, he tried cases where people with legs off. That's all he tries. Okay. After a year of that, he gets pretty immune to the suffering, the anguish, and the pain. We no, nowhere on earth is pain as cheap as it is is in the courthouse. And I've made this jury argument. In America today, we spend more money on trying to relieve pain, assist those in pain, get rid of pain, than we do on anything except defense. And here in the courtroom, they try to get you, jury, to belittle pain. Think about it. If you've read our Constitution and know our law, you know that our government says for murderers and other type criminals, we can kill them, but we can't hurt them. No cruel and unusual punishment. The government forbids, forbids pain, and they're asking you to abide by it, to accept it, to cheapen it. If you don't agree with the law, if you're a religious person, you believe in a God, when God wanted to punish those he wanted punished, what did he do? He created a place called hell. And what is the worst thing he could think of to put in that place? Pain. Burning. Pain. And the loss of the sight of God, mental anguish. Jurors can relate to this. And here they want to belittle pain. They stand alone when they do that. But let me talk to you about a case that I want to tell you about, really about the sanctity of jury trials. That's a major, it's just, we need to fight with everything we've got to preserve this. Now, there have been written, some things have been written about great trials and trials that go down as the greatest trials. And I mentioned that some, one of them they claim was the Scopes, they call it the Scopes Monkey Trial, the environmental trial. I don't think that was it. Others say it was Brown versus the Board of Education. I don't think that was it. Although the Warren Court's opinion changed the face of America. It wasn't Pennzoil against Texaco that I tried, which is the largest jury verdict in the history of law. It wasn't that at all. It, although it did change the way corporate America conducted its business with other corporations. The case I believe was the most important case ever tried was 330 years ago. It was August the 14th, 1670. A congregation came to their church in London intent on peaceful worship. Their church is barred by heavy iron bars and chains. Soldiers of the king guard the entrance. The soldiers are determined to deny the worshipers access to their church. The claim was that these people were dangerous to King Charles II and decided to close it down. His father, Charles I, had been executed by Cromwell, so he was trying to get even with people, I guess. Now, Charles II reigns with power that far greater than anybody before him at that time. This congregation were Quakers who believed in love, friendship, and universal brotherhood. More importantly, they were pacifists who believed that war was wrong. Such teachings represent a threat to the despot expanding his empire or authority by use of force. So the soldiers were not going to let him worship. The young leader of the Quakers made his way through the crowd and confronted the captain of the troops. Friend, he says, we beg of you men of peace to stand aside and allow us to open the house of our Lord that we may properly enter and, wor and worship. We gather in peace and we are determined to honor our Lord upon his day and will not return home until we have done so. The young man's name is familiar to you. His name is William Penn. They don't pay any attention to him. The church is barred. Penn declares that they will have their service in front of the meeting house. Penn is charged then with preaching treason. The criminal trial under the, is 
under the law then, the Magna Carta required a jury of citizens. Now, impaneling a jury in England at that time was simple. The sheriff would just go out on the street and pick up 12 men and bring them in there and tell them you're on the jury. That was it. Well, it really mind-boggling what happened in this case. Penn tries to offer a defense. One, they don't listen to him. They put him in the dock. If you've never been to Old Bailey, I managed to go by there every time I'm in London. It reminds me of what I needed to be reminded of. If a prisoner tried to talk back or answer or do something, they would lower him to below the floor of the courtroom with iron bars over his cage to keep him quiet. Well, one of the 12 men that was picked to be on this jury was a man called Edward Bouchel. He brought with him to the courtroom at Old Bailey a document that served him well. Penn, not tries, to, Penn tries to offer a defense. What the Quakers were doing, he said, is not illegal. For prosecution, Alderman Brown interrupts, you're not here for worshiping God, but for breaking the law. Penn then asks, under what law he has been prosecuted? The answer is, the indictment is grounded upon the common law. When Penn asks what common law, the Lord Mayor orders him thrown into the, bear, the bail dock, which I just described for you. The trial continues with Penn in the pit below the floor. After the third witness testified that he saw Penn preaching from the street but could not hear what he was saying, the three so-called judges send the jury out with instructions to deliberate and bring their verdict back. The men elected a man named Thomas Veer as their foreperson, foreman. There's a short deliberation. Bouchel argues innocence, relying on a document he brought with him and he had in his coat pocket. That document was the Magna Carta. And he was just telling them that about innocence and about the jury's right to declare him innocent. Well, the court was growing impatient with them. They'd been out for two hours, and the court then called them back into the courtroom and then threatened to cut their noses off if they didn't bring back a verdict of, not, of guilty of treason. They went back and would not bring that verdict back. They found Penn guilty of preaching on a certain street in London. They got really angry with them then. The judges then say, and this is a quote out of the case, if the jury does not show respect for this court, you shall all be fined and denied your dinner. You will have your fine, your noses slit and your tongues cut out. That's the way to persuade a jury. <laughs> Back in the jury room, Bouchel pleads with the others to stand up in defense of the freedom of conscience. The bailiffs are there again, quickly, pounding on the door, demanding a verdict. The Lord Mayor asked them if they'd reached a verdict. They had. They reached a verdict not guilty of treason, period. The judges became incensed and fined the prisoners 40 something or other, where they didn't have it. And Veer, the, fr the foreman's uh, daughter was in the gallery, the old Bailey, there's a gallery. And she rushes down to try, and people give her money to try to pay his fine. He'd been real, very sick. He tells them, and his, out of the record, don't, daughter, I'd rather die than do it. And then he died there on the courtroom floor. And six young men carried him out of there. And uh, one of these young men's name was Andrew Hamilton. He was 14 years old. He then migrated to the United States. These men, these jurors, was taken to the penitentiary Newgate Penitentiary, which was a notoriously bad place. And then a lawyer found out about their plight. A lawyer named, his name, the prison's name is Newgate. The lawyer's name was Newgate. He went and filed a writ, habeas corpus. Got him out. The judges were reprimanded horribly in a, in a very fine opinion written lady, later that I'll try to quote part of it to you, that uh, it said, in daunting language, 
Sir John Vaughan set the words out clearly, freeing these men and castigating these so-called judges. Quote, every man sees that the jury is but a troublesome delay, a great charge and of no use in determining right and wrong, and therefore trials by them may be better abolished than continued. But this would be the greatest mischief to all the people of the planet. Those are the words of that appellate judge that wrote it. Now, let's go back, go forward 45 years. In the United States, the trial is being held. We were not yet a republic. The Crown had banned publication of anything detrimental to the, to the king or the crown or England. A man named Peter Zinger owned a printing press. Peter Zinger published a pamphlet that was critical of the king of England. He was being tried for treason. He had no lawyer, and the king, the, the judge had been appointed by the king, asked for a lawyer to represent him. Would anyone in the audience do it? Well, an older man who was in his 70s at that point raised his hand and went in to defend him. And he did it pro bono, and he talked to this jury, that told this jury there's a higher order than what this judge is trying to convince you to do. That's your own conscience, your own responsibility for freedom. And this man's name was Andrew Hamilton, one of the boys that carried Veer's body out of that courtroom. That lesson stayed with him all of his life, and it stayed with me about the jury trial. And he won the case, and therefore a lawyer is responsible for freedom of the press and religion being in our Constitution. It's been a great honor for me to be able to talk to you. I uh, know it sounded like I was preaching tonight, but I felt that way about it, and I wanted to share it with you. I hope you ask me back. Thank you. If, if, there, are any, if, if there are any questions, I'll try to answer them. Even personal ones. Okay. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Jake. I just had a quick question. You talked a lot about uh, equality and how lawyers are, you know, should be fighting for equality. Um, and we talked about corporate governance. And I wonder if you have any impressions about the growing power of uh, corporations in the United States over the course of your career to the average citizen. That makes sense. Well, I don't, I'm not sure I understood your question. I'm not against corporations growing. I want them to grow. We can't have jobs. You know, we need, we need employment. We need everybody to respect everybody else's rights. Right now, we have a Congress and, a, and have a state legislature in my state that's oblivious to the plight of those in need, to health care programs, to education. And there's another, let me tell you, I told this to the legislature when I was asked to talk to a committee that said, well, we got to cut education back. We got to cut back. too much spent on education. I said, "What are you talking about?" And they said, "Well, we can educate them cheaper. We got to do it cheaper. We can't continue to do this." I said, "What you're telling me is you are not for education. When here you are in a state that's got enough ignorance to support 12-year colleges, and they cut it. I was not, I was not effective." Somebody, yes, ma'am. Yeah. You mentioned um, politicians not really being effective at fighting for rights. What, how would you fix the political system? Well, I, I, let me. <laughs> Basically, I'm an anarchist. But uh, you fix it by trying to elect decent, honest people who are not going to be controlled by lobbyists. Right now, the lobbyists control everything, any bill that's getting passed, you, you, you've got to go through them. Uh, I don't care who's president, he can't pass the laws, he can only enforce them. It's Congress that passes the laws. People won't vote. I, I know that last night, 
the last presidential election, what did we get? 46% of the people voting? I think that's about it. But I'll say this to you. We couldn't get rid of that fool we had in there quick enough to suit me. <laughs> I represented his dad once, okay? And I won't tell anybody else about it if you won't. But, but I was asked about him once, and word got back to him, and they asked me to give my impression of him, because I'd met him, I knew him, W. And I said, well, the best I can say about it is, he barely missed being a mongoloid. That was as kind as I knew how to be. Anybody else? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not able to hear it. Well, I think there's hope, but let me tell you something. If you're talking to somebody whose mind is made up, who's prejudiced, you have a difficult time logically convincing him of anything. The only way that I've been able to convince him, and most of my practice now, is representing corporations who steal from other corporations or who get stolen from other, by other corporations. They've discovered the trial lawyer. And I don't do it except on contingency fees. I don't do divorces, windows, lawns, yards and I don't work by the hour, and they know it. But if you're good enough, they'll find you. And uh, most of my cases now come from usually in-house counsel to larger corporations or from large law firms who ask me to take the lead in the trial. But the businessmen are hostile, as you say, generally, because lawyers, they look upon we're paying that lawyer for what? What are we paying that lawyer for? He doesn't produce anything, doesn't make cars, doesn't make candy, doesn't do that. He just out there giving advice, charging us for it. Well, except it all depends on whose ox is in the ditch, okay? If it's their ox, they can't get there quick enough to get the lawyer, okay? Then they get respect if the lawyer knows how to handle himself. But who do they run to when they're in trouble? They denigrate us, but who do they run to when they're in trouble? Us. And we got to keep it that way, so keep your rates up. <laughs> <laughs> who in the hell can pay $500, $700, $800 an hour for a lawyer? Then they expect some guy working as a plumber or a pipe fitter or, or a small businessman. How the hell are they going to do that? They can't do that. They want to do away with, put caps on everything. They put caps on medical malpractice. But here they did it, they did it in Texas. And I've kept up with it. The insurance rates for the doctor's insurance in Texas. Let's just take surgeons, for instance. Five years ago, they put the caps on it. Their rates, their insurance rates, these surgeons' rates have tripled since then. <laughs> gone up every year. What happened? This You lied. You told them you're going to reduce their, their rates and you got them all behind this tort reform nonsense? Now what? And I've represented several doctors. As a matter of fact, I was telling them today there's a statue of me in the heart center and in the medical center in Houston, big building in the lobby. And all these doctors have to walk by it every morning. And many of them I have sued, many of them. 
and they have to walk by it in the morning. Dr. Cooley put it in there, Denton Cooley, famous heart surgeon. He did a bypass on me years ago, and we'd given him a lot of money. So after the, they unveiled this statue, 12 feet, he called me the next morning and says, you got to come over here, Joe, now. I said, why do I got to go over there? I don't, I don't go near there. I'm well. I don't want to get sick over at the medical center. You got to see this. Okay, I, he said, I'll meet you in the lobby. He met me in the lobby, and I go in there. He takes me to where the statue of me is, and one of these doctors had hung a dartboard around the top of his neck of this statue. <laughs> I cracked up. I said, don't you take that down. Leave that up there. I like that. <laughs> is that it? Hi, my name is Nick. Uh, I want to ask, even accepting the positive role that lawyers play, can there be a such thing as too many lawyers? If one more law school opens up to graduate another 100 or 200 lawyers and they're all trying to generate their own fees through additional... If you'll let me rephrase your question... I'll answer it. There can never be too many lawyers. There might be too many pencil-pushing attorneys, but lawyers who are willing to fight for their clients, we don't have enough of them. I don't think so. I think if you're good enough, cream will rise. You'll just make it. Most of what you do will depend on how you start, the reputation you start making when you start. And that really will, and it'll stay with you. You're either going to be ethical and moral and put your client's interest primarily, or you're not. And if you do that, people will know that this man is an honorable man, he's a good lawyer, he's ethical. You know, we are the safeguards of everything, everything. Speech, property, religion, all of it. You do away with us, you can do away with all of that. They don't think it through. They never do till it's too late. And I'll tell you this about this TART reform nonsense. It's like I told Governor Perry, who didn't miss being a mongoloid. <laughs> <laughs> if they were trying to hurt me, they started way too late. Thanks a lot.